Sunday afternoon. I ask you to stand as we sing our first hymn, Rise Up, O Men of God. Rise Up, O Men of God, number 268. Rise up, O men of God, and live with us in peace. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of peace. Rise up, O men of God, His kingdom tarries long. Bring who have stood through the years for the truth of God, and I'm grateful tonight to be in the house of God, and it's a joy to worship together again tonight, and uh, this has been a wonderful week of Baptist men's ministry. On Thursday night, we had the Low Country Bowl, and that stuff was good, I'm just telling you, and then this morning, we had a Baptist men's breakfast, and that stuff was good. And then tonight, we're going to feast around the spiritual things with Baptist men having charge of the worship service. And so we're grateful for our Baptist men and all that they do, and we're appreciative of them, and they're led by Brother Terry Borgschult. And How bad did I butcher that? Now, how bad did I butcher that? That, that wasn't bad? That wasn't bad. It's Brother Terry, where are you? I want you to lead us in prayer. He's out there somewhere. Okay, he's not in here. There he is, Brother Terry. I'm just talking about you. How about leading us in prayer, my brother? Would you do that? Amen. I want to just take this opportunity to say for those who worship my brother back here, I got to meet earlier, uh, and others who visit with us tonight, we thank you for being here. May God bless you tonight as we worship together, and thank you for visiting with us, and, uh, and I trust that we'll have a great time in the Lord tonight. I'm going to do something I don't get to do often. I'm going to go down here and sit where y'all sit, and then enjoy the service. So Brother Allen will be sharing but God bless you for being in the house of the Lord. Brother Allen, come back and lead us. Our offertory hymn this evening is hymn number 277, We Have Heard the Joyful Sound. Let's stand as we sing. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you provided for us to enjoy. Lord, we just pray for all the veterans today, and we just pray that they've had a wonderful day. And Lord, we just thank you so much for the blessings that you give us each day that we just don't understand sometimes. Lord, I just pray now that you'll be with Alan as he brings the message. Just lay it on his heart, Lord, to give us the message that we need. Lord, we just pray that you'll take these tithes and offerings and use them for your will, for we ask these things in Christ's sake. Amen.
Well, I got to thinking, I kind of feel like that episode of the Andrew Griffith Show where he makes an arrest as the sheriff and then he spins around and says, you need to see the magistrate. And he spins around and puts the magistrate hat on. So uh, wearing many hats tonight. But uh, when Terry asked me a couple weeks ago, maybe even a month or so ago, if I would uh, speak tonight, and I said, sure. I never want to turn down a chance to honor and, and glorify the Lord and what he's done in my life and what he's taught me and uh, just to be able to share from the word in that. Let me get, let's go to the word in prayer as the choir is walking out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your graciousness and your love and your mercy toward us. And most of all, we thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ and sending him to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, uh, just uh, we're aware, Father, personally of our sin debt every single day. And Lord, just how, how great a debt that was. And pray that we would live, Father, out of gratitude for what you've done for us. And Father, not out of legalistic to, to try to accomplish something, but, Father, to, to do and to live in such a way that honors you for, for what you've done for us. Father, I pray that you would dwell with us tonight. Father, um, continue to teach me as I share what you've uh, laid upon my heart. And, Father, I just pray that you'd speak through me tonight and that you would be honored and glorified by this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as I pondered what to share regarding men's ministry, um, a lot of thoughts came to my mind, a whole lot of thoughts. And and I just kind of went back and uh, kind of just allowed my, myself to go back. Um, being 52 this year, I've crossed that 5-0 hump, um, you know, and um, it kind of just went back to all the, the different types of ministry that God has allowed me to be involved with during my, you know, adult years, if you would. And I went back and <clears throat> just kind of jotted some of these down and started out as a minister of music in, in Pickin, South Carolina when I was still in college. So even at the age of uh, 20, uh, I was working as a minister of music there, and God allowed me to, to be a part of that there. And while I was there, we worked with the youth uh, at that church at Crescent Hill Baptist Church. So those two things. And then uh, graduated from college and moved to the lower part of the state, which is a different uh, world. It's not just a different part of the state. It's a different world if you've never lived down there. Down in Hampton County, about an hour from Charleston, an hour from Savannah. Um, a different part of the country there. But uh, God allowed us to move down there and continue being a minister of music at a church God led us to down there. Uh, I had no idea that I would continue doing that once I started teaching, but at Sand Hill Baptist Church in Varnville, South Carolina, God allowed us to do that. Then in a year or so, we moved over to Orangeburg, and I taught at another school and got involved in a good church there. And um, while I was there at that high school, at Edisto High School, I uh, started an FCA chapter and began to work with um, the athletes and, and didn't discriminate. It wasn't just athletes, anybody who wanted to come. Uh, we had Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and I had a lot of really good times and influenced some, some young people uh, toward the Lord and seeing some people grow through that ministry there at the high school. While we were there at that church, I was ordained as a deacon at that church, and uh, Luana and I started a couples class. There was no uh, class for couples there, and we had a desire to be a part of that, so uh, God said start one. So we started one and ended up with a lot of couples in that class um, that uh, really were not coming to Sunday school before that. And while we were at St. George Baptist Church in Orangeburg, South Carolina there, uh, God began laying missions on our heart, and that's kind of how we got involved with that and uh, started taking mission trips. And uh, before you know it, God is calling us to missions. And uh, both Lawana and I went on some short-term mission trips as a result and ended up being ordained to the ministry there and sent out of that church to seminary, not knowing where we were going, but we knew that seminary was the next step. And seminary, we wanted to go somewhere close, like Southeastern, but God said, no, that's too close. You can drive back home on the weekends if you want to. So he sent us to a foreign land, Texas. <laughs> sent us to a foreign land, Texas. And if you've ever lived there, you know what I mean, especially if you're originally from South Carolina. Now, if you're from Texas, everywhere else is foreign land. But uh, if you're moved there, and I knew when uh, they didn't have sweet tea and barbecue wasn't yellow, barbecue sauce wasn't yellow, that I was in trouble. And, um, but uh, I got used to those things. And while we were there, God began to narrow some things down. And uh, we got involved in uh, Chinese Baptist Church there in Fort Worth, Texas, and just had some really neat ministry opportunities there at the church. And, um, and God just kind of confirmed that that was the direction he was leading us. And one of the ministries we had was there were business people who would come from Taiwan at that time. And uh, they had some big plants out there that they would come and serve a year or two years, kind of like Michelin does here uh, locally. And uh, while they were there, the Chinese church reached out to them, and they were kind of lonely. And we opened up our home, and uh, we would have people into our home from Taiwan. Who knew, you know, 20 some odd years later, we would end up living in Taiwan. But just being available and opening up our home and just um, making people feel welcome 
uh, another ministry that God gave us while we were there. Um, and then God sent us overseas to China to be missionaries. And uh, just uh, I could talk for hours about the different types of ministry that God gave us while we were there at different seasons. But uh, just, uh, you know, just the ones that really jumped out to me probably was encouraging Christians there. It was one of the highlight ministries for me that God gave me. A lot of that just involved being willing to give them time. You know, sit down and talk about where they're struggling and encourage them and pray with them and jump into God's Word when they have questions about it. I don't know what I'm going to do and say, well, let's see what God's Word says about this. So just encouraging uh, believers there in that way and obviously getting to share the gospel uh, there, you know, after a period of time when we were able to speak the language was a, another ministry that God gave us. After a period of time, uh, we, we, I don't know that we ever saw ourselves as not the young missionaries anymore, but I think everybody looked at us as the older missionaries after a period of time. And uh, so that role afforded us an opportunity to begin to mentor other missionaries that were just coming on the field. Maybe they had, were just starting a family like we had 10, 15 years before and uh, encouraging those missionaries. And, you know, how do we do family life on the mission field? And having done it for, you know, decades or more, we could speak into that. So just a lot of different types of ministry that God gave us over the year. And then it kind of came full circle. Um, you know, I never, ever, 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 you know, thought I would be a minister of music again. Just, just didn't. So never say never. You know, I guess most of you have learned that. You know, so we came back to the States in 2015. I really felt God uh, directing us in that way because of uh, family sickness and needing to take care of, of some family in that way. And, and I hadn't been back in the States a month or six weeks, I don't think. And Billy Whitlock called me, you know, and said, uh, you know, I've known Billy all my life. And he said, uh, we need a minister of music. And I said, okay. <laughs> and, Alan, would you consider it? And I said, me? And I told Luana when I hung up, I said, I hadn't directed music in 20 years. But um, so God worked all of that out and brought us to Eastside. And it's just been uh, the Eastside family has been a place, uh, you know, where, again, I know most of the people at Eastside for all my life through my mom working here and everything, but never attended Eastside. So it's just a, a great place for us to not only do ministry, but to be a part of a, a church family as we came back. And then uh, God opened the door for me to teach again. And, and uh, in my school there where I work at now, the, the principal even calls me preacher. He'll say a word or something, and not a nice word, and he'll go, I'm sorry about that preacher, didn't mean to say that. So, so even the influence there um, at school uh, carries over in terms of having a ministry there. So those were just some of the highlights that popped out into my mind as I, as I briefly just kind of glanced back through, you know, 25 years or so at the various ministry opportunities um, that God has given us. And um, I guess I, I just want to share a few nuggets with you before I share from the Word and what God's laid upon my heart there. But a couple of nuggets that I've gleaned over the years, uh, and, uh, you know, if they don't connect with you right now, that's okay. You can let them go in one ear and out the other ear. That's just fine. But, uh, you know, I believe that a lot of times uh, what I've seen over the years, that God is looking for fat people. Amen. Fat people. And what I mean, that's an acronym. And when I say fat people, God is looking for people that are faithful, available, and teachable. You know, if you can find people that are faithful to whatever it is you give them to do, it don't matter what task it is, how big or how small, if they're faithful and they're available whenever something needs to be done, they'll say, yeah, I got time, I'll do that. Or yeah, I can meet you then, we can talk about that. And they're teachable. In other words, they're willing to learn. God uses those kind of people, irregardless of what letters they may have after their name, whether they have a PhD or whether they have an elementary school education. I've seen that over the years, God looks for people that are faithful, available, and teachable. And I think that's just a characteristic that we kind of hung our hats on overseas when we were looking not only for new Christians, but what kind of people were going to be leaders? What kind of people were going to be leaders? If they were fat people, then, then you can work with them and they would grow. So that's one thing that we learned. I think another thing that as we specifically think about working with Baptist men and kind of applying it to what the theme's been for today is that... Uh, don't grow a ministry, grow men. Don't grow a ministry or don't develop a ministry, develop men. If you do that, God will grow whatever he wants to grow out of that. All too often, it's easy to get an idea of, well, I want to do this, this, and this. Well, if you just pour into people, you think about what Jesus did when he called the disciples to be with him. He built those men and the kingdom grew from there. So uh, I think that was the second nugget that I would pass on. And the third nugget, I just jotted down three is that everyone needs a Paul and a Timothy. And what do I mean by that? Everyone needs a Paul and a Timothy. 
I think no matter how old you are, no matter how old you are, we always need wiser people who are speaking into our life, wiser people that we can go to for godly counsel, for biblical counsel, for people that will call us out and say, hey, you know, I think what you're thinking is going to get you off track and going to get you in the ditch if you aren't careful. And people that you'll listen to those people. You need to have a Paul. Or maybe it's a multiple people who act as that Paul role. But you need to have a Paul in your life, no matter how old you are. We also need Timothys that we're pouring into, that we are their Pauls. So I think if Christians in the church would develop that practice of, hey, who's my Pauls, who are my Timothys? then kingdom growth happens in that way. And that's kind of how we looked at it overseas as well in terms of looking for a Paul. Somebody's going to hold me accountable. Somebody who will tell me something maybe when I don't want to hear it. But because of the role I've given them and the authority I've given them in my life, I'm willing to listen to it. And we also need to have people that we're pouring into. So those were just three nuggets as I thought about the ministry that I've been a part of that I wanted to share with you just off the top of my head. I want to transition just a little bit as we talk about men tonight. And ladies, if I sound very male tonight, it's intentional um, because it's not Baptist Women's Night. So don't take anything and, and be uh, in any way uh, offended by it. Just apply it to you as well because I think everything that I'm going to share uh, is applicable to Christians as a whole. But specifically, you may hear me just say men or, or, or a man or whatever. Uh, that's intentional. Um, in terms of focusing on Baptist men and what I believe Terry wanted me to share and what he asked me to share is, is, you know, I want to share with you first that reaching men is important. Reaching men is important. It's not just something that's, that, that happens, but reaching men is important and it needs to be intentional. And I don't say that in any way to minimize women or children or any, any way, but men are important. Men are important. You know, I think we live in a society. Let me phrase that. I don't think. We live in a society that wants to minimalize and marginalize men in any way they can. If you don't believe that, just watch the news. Watch the news. Um, You know, society as a whole, our society, our culture here in America, wants to minimalize and marginalize the role of men. And the family has suffered because of that. You know, men are important. Men are important. And I, I don't know that, I don't think it's an overstatement as I thought about it, to say that we live in a, a time in history where more than any other time, men are, are, are being marginalized and being pushed out. Uh, and, and, you know, TV shows, if you watch any of those sitcoms, and most of us shouldn't watch them, you know, they make fun of the man. They make fun of the father role. Uh, so everything in our society is anti-male. And it's important for the church to reach men and to help those men grow. Let me tell you why a man and why men are important. Because if you reach a man you reach his family. A changed man will influence his family and his marriage. A changed family will influence their neighborhood and their community. A changed community will influence the county and the state. And that state can change that country. Men are important. It starts with men. There's a song that I'm sure probably every one of you in here have heard at some point in time. Uh, sung often by the Gaither, Gaither Vocal Band. I think Guy Penrod is the one who sings um, the lead on that song. But I want to read the words to that song. And this song just confirms how important men are and what happens when men are reached for Christ. The song is called The Baptism of Jesse Taylor. Among the local taverns, there'll be a slack in business because Jesse's drinking came before the groceries and the rent. Among the local women, there'll be a slack in cheating because Jesse won't be stepping out again. They baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. Jesus gained a soul, and Satan lost a good right arm. They all cried hallelujah when Jesse's head went under, because this time he went under for the Lord. The scars on Jesse's knuckles were more than just respected. The county courthouse records tell all there is to tell. The pockets of the gamblers will soon miss Jesse's money, and the black eye of the law will soon be well. Listen to this third verse. From now on, Nancy Taylor can proudly speak to neighbors. Hear that community? She'll tell them how much Jesse took up with little Jim. Hear the family being changed? Now, Jimmy's got a daddy, and Jesse's got a family, and Franklin County, the whole county, has got a lot more man. You hear how that song talks about while reaching one man, changed a family, changed a community, and impacted the county. So you reach a man, the impact that it can make is great, is great. 
If we as men are to make a lasting impact on this world, then men must be reached for Christ. With that in mind, let's look at what type of men, us, are needed for the task of reaching men. So we're going to look at what kind of men are needed according to Scripture to reach men. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to 1 Timothy 6, 11, and 12. And I didn't talk to Pastor Wayne about what he was going to preach this morning. I realized this morning when he got up and started reading, I said, maybe I should have talked to him a little bit. But uh, there'll be a little bit of overlap at one point, but uh, I felt good after this morning. It's like, Lord, you're still telling me to, to share what you've laid upon my heart this week. Um, but turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. And uh, before we read those two verses, I want to set the background of what's happened because this is the end of 1 Timothy here, chapter 6. Chapter 6 is the last chapter in the book. So I want to set the background for you of what's happened in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, so that when we read this, you'll have some context of what it means. As a Christian man, Timothy basically has been given a ministry, if you want to use what we're talking about now, he's been given a ministry at the first of this chapter, first of First Timothy by Paul. Paul is writing the letter. It's very clear, chapter 1 there, verse 1 and 2, who Paul is writing the letter to, Timothy. And he actually calls him his dear son in the faith. So Paul looked at Timothy as a father figure in that way. You're going to have to bear with me. Let me get my stuff organized up here just a little bit. So he looked at him as his true son in the faith. And Paul had asked Timothy to stay there in Ephesus where he was at and basically to be Paul in Paul's absence is what he was asking him to do. He didn't come out and say, I'm not there and I want you to be me. But if you look at what he's asking him to do, that's the role he's given, him to, him, given to him and asking him to do. Paul went on in the first couple of chapters and list a whole bunch of issues that Timothy was likely to face in being the pastor, if you will, or the one to continue growing this church. And some of the issues that he mentioned were false teachers, how to deal with false teachers, how to instruct the church on key issues such as worship, the role of women in the church, deacons, elders, overseers, widows in the church, how to deal with Christians that were slaves, how to deal with money in the church, how to deal with love of money and placing money in a place where it should not be in terms of prominence. Just think how Timothy felt when he was given that task. I think I would have felt overwhelmed. And you got to remember, Timothy, not a pastor of 20 or 30 years and said, oh yeah, this is my fourth pastorate. We can jump right in there. I know how to do this. No, Timothy didn't have that kind of experience. And Timothy was not even a seasoned missionary. You know, he came to faith and had not been, he was not a brand new Christian, but he did not have the extensive experience factor, if you would, by looking at Timothy and say, oh yeah, he's fit for the job. So Paul is writing this letter to Timothy basically to say, you can do this. You can do this. I believe it. I wouldn't have left you if I didn't. And, oh, and by the way, in chapter 4, he says, don't let them look down on you because you're young either. But he continues to tell them throughout the, chat, throughout the book, you know, live your life in such a way that they will see that. And so we come to where we're at right now, and Paul's kind of winding it down here at the end of the letter. He's bringing it to a close, and here's what he says. Verse 11, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. And we'll stop right there. The first thing, I want us to see a couple of things here that he tells Timothy. There's three things, really, three charges, if you will, that Paul gives to Timothy. The first one there he sees, he says, is flee from all this. What does flee mean? Flee means to run away. Run away. If you're fleeing something, you're not just casually, <laughs> no, that's not your picture of, of fleeing. You picture you flee from a burning house. It's kind of the way you want, you want to picture you. You flee from something that you really want to get away from and put some distance between you. you know, if a tiger's chasing you through the jungle, that's the picture of fleeing. You know, a house that's burning or something that's going on. If you've seen the, the tragedies that happen around the world, several tsunamis have happened in recent years. And when the people finally realize the danger and what is there from that big wall of water, they're trying to flee and get away from that. So Paul uses that word here. And he says, flee, so I think we understand what that means, but he says, from all this, 
Well, it's important for us to understand if we want to make application to our life what he means when he says all of this. And I think we can obviously make a generalized reference to everything that he said in the book, obviously, and we see it as a book, but it was a letter to Timothy. Everything that came before this in the letter, Timothy could understand, oh, Paul would tell me to flee from all of this. But specifically, as we look at the context here, he, t- he had just got through telling him some other things. And look back also in chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 3, and we're going to read through verse 10 here. And this directly precedes what we just read in verse 11. Starting with verse 3, chapter 6. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then he says, flee from all this, Timothy. So I think you can see specific application that he said all of these things I just got through telling you in the letter don't have any part to do with it. Don't have any part to do with all of those things that he just listed out. That's a pretty good list of things if you think about it in our life to flee from. A lot of those things. I just, that one in there jumped out to me. Constant friction. You know, constant friction. There's just some good things in there for us to avoid as we go through there. And you know, Paul's advice is Not just, Timothy, watch yourself about these things. Timothy, be careful around these things. Timothy, you you better think about these things. No, I think he realizes the danger that these things pose, so he says, don't have anything to do with them. Flee, run away from them if you have to. And basically, it's radical action. You know, don't just, when you encounter it, think about what should you do. When you encounter this, don't pray about it and say, Lord, how, how should I handle this? Some things are black and white as they need to be. And when we see it and we know they're wrong, we need to distance ourselves. And that's what he was telling him to. You know, fleeing is the opposite of coveting, if you will. When you covet something, you linger. You linger. If you covet your neighbor's car, you're probably going to spend some time just lingering, looking out the door at that car. You know, anything you can think about that you covet, you're going to spend time gazing at it, thinking about it. But fleeing is just the opposite. Get away from it. Get it as far away from you as you can. There are other places in Scripture where Christians are also told to flee. In 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, tells us to flee the youthful lust which war against our soul. Anybody remember old Joseph in the Old Testament? Remember old Joseph and that woman named Potiphar? Yeah. You know, and Joseph, you know, was in, you know, encountered that, that situation where, you know, her husband was away and uh, all she wanted to do was to take advantage of him in that situation. And, uh, you know, what did he do? He left. He ran. He didn't just hang around. He fled the situation. So there are times, and we see them clearly in Scripture, where fleeing is what we should do. You know, we need to recognize the destructiveness of sin and be willing to flee. I'm sure we can all think of People, especially men, as we think about men's ministry, men that God had blessed with a vibrant ministry. Maybe they'd been doing it for many, many years. And we don't know all the ins and outs of different situations, but you can tell by how they ended up falling. When they first encountered that temptation, they lingered instead of fleeing. And you look at what it cost them. You look at what it cost them. So fleeing is good advice and something that we should practice as men of God if we want to reach men. There's a second thing this passage tells us. So the first one is we should flee these things. The second one, if we want to do like Preacher Dicker does and give you another F word, we'll use follow after some things. Some versions use pursue, but we can use another F there and go follow after or pursue. That means to go after it with all you got. Follow after these things, Timothy. 
Don't just meander toward them, but follow after these things with all you got and with all your heart. And if you think about it, when you choose to flee from something over here, you're running toward something else. So I'm choosing to flee this and follow this. I'm not just choosing to flee and come here and stop and be in the middle and be neutral. I'm choosing to flee here and follow over here, something that is opposite. So what does he tell him to pursue or to follow after? He gives him a list there, and he says these things you should pursue. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And really, you know, these are just the total opposite of those other things that Paul had just got through writing. And if you look at this list, these are the things that satisfy deeply. All of those other things satisfy temporarily, and then you need more. You know, Paul specifically spoke about, you know, the love of money and be careful about that. Money can buy things that satisfy you for a little while, but then before long, those things get old. They lose their shine, as you say. And then it's like, oh, I need something else. I need something else. So these are the things here, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, that satisfy deeply and don't have to be replenished time after time after time. And we also see, this, this kind of is like what, what, what we see in other places in the New Testament where we're told to put off this and to put on. We're never just told to put off and be unclothed. We're told, put off this and in its place, put on this. Same thing here, flee this and follow this. It's the same type of analogy, if you will. So we should follow after hard in that way. And you know, it's interesting to note here that Paul does not give Timothy specific instructions in how to follow. If you're like me, maybe your mind thinks that way. Oh, I don't know what I got to do. How do I do it? You know, but Paul doesn't give him instructions in how to do that. I think that's very interesting. He just says, do this. Well, I think obviously from having been with Paul, that was part of Paul's thought process in terms of you've seen me do these things. And as you have seen me do this, now you, Timothy, do that. So you see that mentoring and, and part of how to live a godly life is caught as much as it is taught. You sit down and you look at God's Word and you begin to, to turn it over and you say, ah, oh. and then you can see someone's life that you know who's living that out and it kind of comes together like this. The power of a godly influence, the power of a godly mentor. Oh, that's how I strive after righteousness. That's how I strive after godliness. That's how I put love into practice as a man of God. So I believe that's one way that Paul understood Timothy would be trying to grow in these areas. It's kind of that iron sharpening iron principle that we see in the book of Proverbs. When we lived overseas, um, I had numerous opportunities to work with new believers because the, the people that we were working with, there were zero believers among them when we got there or none that we knew about. And uh, it was interesting when they would come to faith you know how much Christian background they had? <laughs> Less than zero. I mean, they didn't have any background about what it meant to be a Christian. And in one sense, that was good. And in one sense, that, that just made things uh, difficult because you could try to teach a concept or, or get into God's Word, but then they would look at and say, what's that look like? Or how do you do that? So a lot of what we did not only was teaching the Word of God and sharing out of the Word of God, but just letting those people be with us. Our door was open sometimes more than we wanted it to be. People would come and didn't have to have an invitation, and uh, that's the way the, the culture was there, and uh, they would show up, whether it was convenient for you or not, they were there. And, uh, you know, the visit wouldn't last 20 or 30 minutes. It would be hours. And uh, for somebody like me who's always lived by a watch and by the clock, that's, more dif that's difficult. Luana's much more relational, so that wasn't a challenge to her, um, but uh, that was a difficult thing for me. So I share that because... One of the biggest ministries that God gave us was just allowing the people to be with us and to see how, how did we do Christian family? What did that look like? And they could see that in our home. And how did a godly man, trying to be one, treat his wife? How did they interact with each other? Because they had no idea now as a Christian what that meant. And they could read about it, but they could talk about it. One of the biggest witnesses that we had is we had Muslims, and some of them never came to faith who would say about our team, said, you guys love each other in ways that we don't love each other. And we didn't really talk about how we loved each other. They just said, you love each other. And we can see that love. You're different. 
in that way. So the way you live your life is a testimony in many, many aspects. So we had opportunities, multiple opportunities, um, just from living our lives around them. And people need to see it. People need to see it. You know, I find that being back in America, American culture is not friendly to that type of thing in terms of sharing your life with people. We're, we're so busy, we're so busy, and our life is so compartmentalized here. You know, this is the time where I can be available for 30 minutes or, or 40 minutes or an hour, but that may not be when somebody needs you in terms of a new believer. Um, and so it, it, it can be a challenge in terms of being available in that way. As men of God, we must not only pursue and follow after the things of God, but we must help other men do the same. We cannot stay idle. On June the 15th, 1957, a brand new car was buried, this is a true story, in a concrete vault under the courthouse lawn in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In June 2007, 50 years later, the car was unearthed as the city celebrated Oklahoma's 100th year of statehood. Writing in the Tulsa World newspaper, Randy Crable said, Now we know what 50 years in a hole, in other words, doing nothing, does to a Plymouth Belvedere. Some of you may know what a Plymouth Belvedere is. Um, water seeping into the vault had turned the once shiny car into a rusted monument to the past. A hot rod expert hired to start the engine pronounced it hopeless. Hopeless. As Christian men, we dare not come and sit on a pew. We dare not come and take up space because that's what happened to that car. It took up space for 50 years. We have to be active in sharing what God has given us. That doesn't mean you go into full-time Christian ministry. God plants you where He wants you. He just wants to use you where you are where you are. Spiritual inactivity corrodes the soul like moisture acting on metal. How are you doing in this area? Are you pursuing and following after the things of God in your life? And what other men are you helping to grow in those areas? Well, there's a third thing here that he tells Timothy. He told him to flee. He told him to follow after those things. And then at the start of verse 12, he tells him to fight. Fight the good fight. And he says specifically, fight the good fight of the faith. But I want to focus on that word fight. And uh, I, I want to preface all that I'm going to say about that word is I'm not talking about a bad attitude or a mean attitude, but I, I'm talking when we talk about fight, uh, an underlying knowledge that I'm in a fight. I'm in a fight, and I've got to persevere, and that's part and parcel to what I've been called to. It's, I've been called to a fight when I signed up to be a Christian. It's all through Scripture. We talked about it this morning in terms of a soldier, being a soldier. There's only one reason you called a soldier. You're trained to do what? Trained to fight. If there was not any chance, zero chance, that a fight would happen, we don't need soldiers. That's why, that's why, you, that's why you have soldiers. And so Paul tells Timothy here to fight the good fight. So every Christian, as... Pastor Wayne mentioned this morning, has been drafted into God's army. I won't say drafted. We chose. We signed up, as we talked about this morning. We chose. We signed up. God didn't draft us. He allowed us to come into his army. You know, the hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, we all sing it, and it talks about being a soldier for Christ. As Christians, we are in a battle. We fight against Satan. We sure do. But that's not all we fight against. We fight against the fallen world we live in. I know I do. So we fight against Satan. We fight against the fallen world in. You know who else I fight against? I fight against me. This flesh is still here. I, I live with it every single day. Every single day. So there's many fronts that we are in a constant fight. You know, I even asked myself as I was thinking through and preparing this, is it possible, is it possible to be a genuine Christian and not be in the fight in some way? I don't know, go home and do a Bible study on that. I think it'll challenge you. Is it possible to be a genuine Christian and not be in the fight in some way? I think that's a challenging question. I think too many Christians disengage from the fight and end up falling by the wayside if we aren't careful. There was a man who had a shrub in his garden, and its leaves were poisonous. 
He had children who used to put anything in their mouth, so he cut down the shrub. But the roots of that shrub went deep. And part of his diligence was continuing to snip off those shoots that would grow back up because invariably, no matter how much he dug, no matter how much he cut it off, it would pop back up. You know, I know my heart is like that. My flesh is ever there. If I'm not diligent to continue to surrender that daily to the Lord, my flesh will pop back up, and before you know it, it's just run amok in that way. So we must keep our eyes open and fight the good fight. When you came to Christ, think about when you came to Christ, what type of mindset did you come with? Was it a, man, I'm in the army. I'm in the fight. Or was it, all my problems are going to be okay now? But if you look at Scripture, and that's all we're looking at, look at Scripture, look at the fine, outstanding people. How about Noah? How do you think he was treated while he was building that boat? Yeah, I don't think Noah had a very good life, if we're honest, in terms of being isolated, no friends. I mean, who, who was his friends? Everybody's ridiculing him. And he didn't build that boat in a week. We're not talking about a week of ridicule. It took a long time. And we know what kind of person Noah was, and we know that no one else except his family made it on the boat. So even before God ever gave him that command, I imagine there wasn't much in common. Noah was living a life set apart. Well, how about Job? Job was a, a, a good Christian man. His life was easy, wasn't it? Yeah, Job had a real easy life. Everything was just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. No, if you read Job's life, he, he was in a fight. And we know the Scripture tells us that Job was a righteous man. But Job was in a fight, and it cost him a lot. Job was in a fight. Well, how about David? You know, David, Scripture tells us, was a man after God's own heart. Wasn't David the same one that was running for his life from Saul, being pinned to the wall with Saul's spear? And for, you know, decades being chased by Saul, being cornered in a cave, not knowing if he's going to make it out alive. And then after he gets to be king, you think, whew, everything's good now. Well, David's family was a picture of dysfunctionality uh, and just, you know, just not good at all. So you look at David's um, life there. Let's jump over to the New Testament. How about Stephen, Stephen the evangelist? How'd things turn out for Stephen? He was in a fight now. Stephen got up and said Stephen would preach. Uh, Stephen was in a fight, and he, at least in his earthly form, Stephen was stoned to death. You know, it didn't do too well. It didn't come out. How about Paul? You know, Paul wrote a lot. So we have a lot of records about Paul. You know, it seems like to me every time you read about Paul, he's either being shipwrecked, beaten, chained. In fact, most of his letters, it seems like he's writing them from some place that I wouldn't want to be. You know, and when he's not... Paul just seemed like the kind of personality that everybody didn't like too good. They was trying to run him out of town. Uh, I think he was stoned a couple of times and, you know, left for dead. Well, how about if we forget all of those people and just look at Jesus? You know, the king of glory never did anything wrong. Surely, when he walked on the earth, would have a good life, wouldn't he? Born in a worse place than any of us were ever born. Constantly misunderstood even by his own family, misunderstood. Son, why'd you stay back there? Didn't you know we'd already left? You know, so even his family didn't understand him. And then what about his ministry? Yeah, he, he was constantly being sought to be killed and finally was killed. So I think if we just look at the example of person after person after person who diligently sought to follow Christ in the, old, in the Bible, is, it was a fight. It was a fight. And I believe it should be no less for us today. It is a fight to follow. I want to leave you as we're closing here. I read about a missionary years ago in the jungles of New Guinea who wrote the following letter to his friends back home. He wrote this letter and sent it back home. Man, it's great to be in the thick of the fight, to draw the old devil's heaviest guns, to have him at you with depression and discouragement, slander and disease. He doesn't waste time on a lukewarm bunch. But he hits good and hard when a fellow is hitting him hard. He can all, you can always measure the weight of your blow by the one you get back. When you're on your back with fever and at your last ounce of strength, when some of your converts backslide, when you learn that your most promising inquirers are only fooling you, when your mail gets held up and some of your supporters don't bother to answer your letters, is that the time to put on mourning? No, sir. That's the time to pull out the stops and shout hallelujah. The old fellow's getting it in the neck and he's hitting back. Heaven is leaning over with the battlements and watching. 
Will he stick with it, they say? As they see who is with us, as they see the unlimited reserves, the boundless resources, as they see the impossibility of failure, how disgusted and sad they must be when we run away. Glory to God, we're not going to run away. We're going to stand and fight. That was from a missionary, and I'll be honest with you. I, we encountered some difficult situations, but I don't know in the heat of those situations if I would have been able to write such a letter because your flesh rises up. But that missionary, I shared that with you to realize that he realized he was in a fight day after day after day. The attitude of that old missionary is the attitude that Paul was wanting Timothy to have as he was there. He wanted him to have that. And let me pull that all together with this here. What if every Christian man at Eastside Baptist Church took the attitude of, I'm going to fight for the souls of all the lost men in liberty? Let me say that again. What if every Christian man at Eastside Baptist Church took the attitude of, I'm going to fight for all the lost souls of men in liberty? I'm going to fight in prayer for them. I'm going to fight in visiting them. I'm going to fight in calling them. I'm going to fight in texting them, whatever it takes. I will not be discouraged or defeated by the enemy because this is the task that the Lord has given to me at Eastside Baptist Church. And I am assured of victory because of who my commander and chief is. Leave you with a question. How would liberty be changed if every man at Eastside Baptist Church said, I'll do that and just focus on the men of liberty? I think Liberty has a population of 3,000 people. We're not talking about a whole lot of men. How would our community be changed? How would our county be changed? How would the upstate of South Carolina be changed? How would the state be changed? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these words written thousands of years ago that are still applicable to us today to flee things that that are going to pull us down and pull us asunder, flee things that are detrimental to our spiritual growth. And Father, how we should follow hard after the things of you and the things you set before us. And then, Father, to be willing to stand and fight and be counted with uh, all the Christians of all the ages. Father, to realize that conquest doesn't happen without fight. And Father, you tell us how to fight on our knees in prayer and to be willing to stand for Christ. Lord, lead us and guide us. Show us each, not only as men, but as every member of Eastside Baptist Church, show us what you want our ministry to be. Father, that we may be in the fight that you've given us to be a part of. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The way God spoke to your heart, and, and you want to answer that call, the Lord man of God. And maybe there's a burden you need to come and pray over. Maybe you need to come and be saved. Whatever need there is in your life tonight, that need can be met at the altar before our Lord. And so I want us to sing the hymn of invitation. I'm going to ask Alan to pull on another hat, go back to that other rope, and would you lead us in invitation, okay. brother? Number 182, the Savior is waiting.
Thank you, my brother. What a challenge. I appreciate that so much. Good job, Brother Allen. Uh, I, want, I know you'll want to come by and speak to him and tell him what a good job he did as well. Uh, we were privileged to be uh, over at uh, Forsland's house a few weeks ago, and, and Brother Allen was sharing some of the, the, the experiences of their ministry in China. And I, I was just, oh, man, I was just... Uh, like a sponge, listening to, to the stories, how twice they were kicked out of China. Uh, you know, we have to fight the fight, but I'm grateful he went back. And uh, the Lord protected them and was with them. And uh, I'm grateful for men who are willing, who's willing to stand and fight the good fight of faith. Thank you, Brother Allen, and as well as your family. I know they were a part of that ministry there for 20 years, Southern Baptist Missionary. Uh, to China. You went to um, Taiwan? Yeah, after, you left China. after you left, one time you had to go to Taiwan. And, uh, but yeah, man, what a great story. If you ever get a chance to sit and talk with them uh, about their ministry, I'm telling you, it's rich and deep. And so thank you, my friend, for sharing part of your story tonight uh, about where the Lord has taken you. Are there any announcements? Brother Terry, you did such a great job, Baptist Men's Week. Any announcements you have from your direction? No? Nope. Any, anybody else? Any announcements? Yes, sir. Stewardship committee meeting after church tonight. Anybody else? It's been a good day in God's house. Amen? And uh, again, if you're visiting tonight, thank you for sharing this time with us, and I hope you'll come back and worship with us again. Uh, we were laughing tonight in church council or this afternoon. Uh, um, Braden told us said that they had wound up at last... This past week, 1,200 people viewed the service from East Side last week, and 80 of them said they liked it. <laughs> I, I know those two are not all in sync, but, uh, man, I thank you for, um, for all that y'all do for the Lord. Let's bow for our benediction. Father in heaven, thank you for loving us, and thank you, Lord, for what our hearts have felt here tonight. We pray that you'd dismiss us with your love and bring us back to the appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.